Hey, good morning, and welcome to the New Breed of Business and Romans 911 Joint Study. I'm here, Greg Healy, with Grant Barry and the One New Man team. Um, and we are going to talk about today uh, the topic in uh, keying off the study guide. And you can get this study guide on the Romans 911 website if you don't have it already. Um, pages 155, I believe it's it's um, it's certainly part 11 in our syllabus, but um, it is about the fivefold ministry and the importance of this as we press into the new wineskin of what God is doing in terms of the one new man, but also in terms of how we look at economy and how we look at finance. So I'm going to turn it over to Grant. Good morning, brother. Good morning, Greg. Uh, excited about today's teaching. One thing I want to say is that um, a lot of the teachings in the second part of Romans 911 are really to give us a vision and a focus of how the Lord wants to reform his church so that he can release greater anointing and power upon it. Uh, and there are significant gifts that he's given to the body that we're not really using properly. And so one of the focuses of this teaching is not, is not just to recognize what the fivefold gifts are, but also to challenge us into an understanding and a vision of how we need to pray for the ecclesia, for the church to come into these reforms. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Hey, and while you're sharing your screen, I just wanted to mention to everybody, if you weren't with us last week, we had the OMC example with Dale Schlafer, and it's a great interactive discussion and interview about how the fivefold and the one who man is working in Bradenton, Florida and the surrounding area. So that's a great example. So as I was saying, um, you know, in fact, Greg and I were talking about this a little bit, you know, when we got on with a call this morning, we're, we're not going to see uh, the flourishing of, of, of the reforms in the church until the leadership finds ways, until the church leadership finds ways to break through um, into the fivefold. And what we'll discover in these teachings is, in the old wine skin, you know, we have this analogy where we are uh, really, we have, God's given us five cylinders, if you like, you know, when you look at a car, a car has four, six or eight cylinders. Some even have 12. Most cars don't have five cylinders, by the way. That that would right, be a, I know. one Audi. But, I think it's five but, but the, the analogy works in the sense that God has given us five gifts and we're, we're not we're only using really half of them. And so we're stifled. So, you know, in the old wineskin, there are um, really, when we think of the, 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 the church leadership and the governance of the church flowing in the apostolic and the prophetic evangelistic, pastoral, and teaching focuses, we're really only, you know, focusing on two, two and a half, pa pastoral teaching and a little bit of evangelism in missions, etc. cetera. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, it's it, the apostolic and the prophetic lay the foundation. They're in the foundation of, of the ecclesia and the gifts of there that we we all have them we flow in them but we just need to find ways to, how to function in a more healthy way so we can break through and and of course there are lots of blocks and obstacles that the enemy puts there to stifle us and to strip us of power and a lot of what we teach in the romans 911 project is disarming the evil one becoming more aware of the way that he sows amongst us and, and beginning to come into a greater humility, repent, 
confession and repentance and begin to change these things. So, all right. Were you able to, to bring up the teachings? No, your website's all frozen up on me. So you keep going and I'll try to get this going. Huh. Okay. So, um, one of the one of the things that um, one of the most effective ways I think that we can experience change and transformation in the fivefold is actually regionally. Um, I think the greatest barrier is to get through the ego of these titles, even those in the body that are moving in. Um, in the fivefold, even perhaps to let go of a uh, Christian, Christian Greg, even to let go of um, titles, you know, uh, and one of the things we suggest in the teachings are to find ways to, to um, communicate these gifts without like saying, hey, I'm, you know, I'm an apostle, you know, and um, listen, we, all of us, if anyone starts a ministry, right, they're moving apostolically, right? Anyone that hears visions, you know, gets insights, dreams, they're moving prophetically. And there are different weights and measures to these gifts. Um, uh, 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 you know, Yeshua moved in, uh, and as we come into the teachings, we're, we're going to see all this, but I think one of the greatest focuses where we can experience this transformation is is regionally. Is like, for example, where where you are, the A team in Burton on Trent, right? Burton upon Trent, right? Um, you know, be, to begin to pray for the the all the different reforms to come into God's needing our partnership from the Watchman on the Wall. You guys are leading the way. You're getting the revelation and the insight. Now the question is, what do we do with it? Okay, you have the knowledge, okay? But now he needs to equip us to begin to pray into. And this is why the watchman is such an integral, significant part of the fivefold. Because in a sense, they help provide the fuel and the flow and the power from the Holy Spirit to all of the fivefold gifts. But if we can begin to just acknowledge the leaders that God is raising up regionally um, and, and encourage them to move in their gifts. I mean, no one is, can be a self-proclaimed uh, apostle or prophet, but, but apostles and prophets are recognized by the people they serve. So, all okay. right, you've got so where, where we want to start this video, Grant? What, what minute at second? You could start at the beginning, brother. There is a new wine skin coming with new wine being poured that? out from heaven to restore yes. much of the ecclesia. We've discussed changes in the one you man and adjustments to our eschatology. And we also need to address corporate changes coming to the end time church as a whole, not just to return to the fullness of the one you man between Jew and Gentile, but also to return to our apostolic roots that Yeshua created after the resurrection as the church was beginning to emerge. The Lord has bestowed on his body gifts of the Holy Spirit and gifts of governance. In this next session, we will discuss the gifts of the fivefold, which is perhaps one of the most controversial subjects in the church where great division and misunderstanding exist, perhaps even greater than with our end time views. In this session, I have a two-fold approach. First, to try to introduce greater clarity and understanding to the five-fold gifts themselves. Second, to encourage the body, both those who are already engaging the gifts, as well as those who have issues or are rejecting them, to enter into much greater dialogue and understanding, to try and find a way through for us for the benefit of the Lord's kingdom.
and the authority that I believe that he wants to release through these gifts of governance. If we can only find greater humility to embrace one another's perspectives and some of the obstacles holding us back from potentially moving forward. This is one of the main goals of this session. Pastor or Rabbi, would you please lead us in a prayer for us and for the Ecclesia, for the Church of the Living God? Let me just pray. Hallelujah, Father, thank you uh, for um, the modifications in your body uh, that are needed during this time for us to look at and uh, contemplate and embrace that uh, you would begin to open up the doors for us to be uh, made ready and more readily move into your end time plans. And Lord, this also relates to the beautiful five-fold gifts that you released to your body at the same time the church was being established of the apostolic gifts, the prophetic gifts, the evangelistic gifts, pastoral gifts, and teaching gifts. And we ask, Father, that you would uh, uh, anoint this session for me to be able to address these issues in a way that would help us to break down some of the barriers that are holding us back and help us to more readily embrace them. And I think part of that is to, for us to, to be able to understand how fivefold functions as well as how you use it in governance. So, Lord, I ask for your blessing, your anointing, and your insight that you would uh, speak through me by your spirit in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So before I was in full-time ministry, I was actually an entrepreneur in the cosmetic world for 33 years. And during that time, I also led missions to the former Soviet Union to help uh, uh, awaken the Russian Jews to faith. And today, we would refer to this role as a marketplace leader. And I often joke with the Lord that he switched my focus from outer beauty to inner beauty. And it's funny, but it's also true. And over the course of those 33 years, God enabled me to build several businesses from scratch. And when we give our lives over to him, it's just remarkable how he uses different circumstances to prepare us for the ministry focuses that he has for us in the future. Here I'm reminded of that movie in The Karate Kid, Wax On, Wax Off, you know? And I can tell you that I've done a lot of waxing on and waxing off in my life. And here I am having had all of this experience in building businesses from scratch and taking ideas and watering them and nurturing them and enabling these babies to come to life and to flourish. And here we are uh, doing the same thing now with this reconnection message that is still not that well known or even understood, yet it needs to be nurtured and watered in such a way that this message is going to come forth uh, to really bring about revolutionary change in the body. And when you build any business or ministry, there are always going to be obstacles and hurdles to overcome. It's important in a business always to keep the wheels moving forward. But every so often, a cog would get stuck in the wheel. Do you know, are you familiar with the cog? It, it's often what, uh, it's a piece that can stop the wheel from, from turning. And similarly, in any successful business, all the bases need to be covered. And it's the first base for successful business that if you don't have finance 
and distribution and perhaps a uniqueness of, of product quality, and then the operations to fulfill the demand, invariably one of these areas is going to suffer, which is going to cause damage to the whole. And this, interestingly, is how I see most of the church currently regarding its final restoration. Cogs are stuck and bases are not being covered as they ought. And it's interesting to note that since its reformation, the restoration of the church didn't come at once, but rather over a period of time. And here's a brief overview that was actually written by Robert Heidler in one of his books about end times. Salvation came about in the 16th century. Holiness in the 18th century. Gifts of the Holy Spirit in the 20th century. And now God is restoring the church's apostolic foundations and restoring the one you met. And the apostolic foundations of the church are connected to the church's restoration of Israel because they come from the same place. This is how the church, when it was founded, operated with the fivefold ministry gifts. I want to talk to us in this process about the old wineskin versus the new wineskin. In the emerging prayer movement, we often refer to this restoration as the new wine or the new wineskin that is coming. And while it's true to say that mature wine is better, new wine still has its flaws, right? But it's apparent that the church is still in great need of reform and that the old wine has passed its peak, if you like, and is not working anymore the way that it should. And this is not to say that there's not a healthy remnant in the church. Obviously, God's doing beautiful things with the remnant body that is arising, especially through the prayer movement. But when we look at the church as a whole, hasn't it lost honor, respect, and esteem? And this is what Nehemiah discovered when he got off his horse and he went around the walls of Jerusalem and realized that Jerusalem had come into disgrace and that his job was to rebuild the city walls. And our job is to rebuild and help the father restore love and unity in his family so that those walls can be built up once again. So now more than ever, the church not only needs a new wine skin, but new wine to make it right. And this is the prayer and the heart cry of the emerging prayer movement. Lord, make us new and thriving again. Hallelujah. Here's where I believe, though, lie the greatest challenges because the old wineskin hasn't really been playing with a full deck and along the way it's become stifled and stuck. Reform is greatly needed in many areas of the church primarily because Yeshua has given his body gifts and governance that it's not using properly. But now in this time of repentance and restoration and reconnection and realignment that will lead us to revival. Now is that time that God has chosen to begin to address these issues so that we can become healthier 
and stronger as a whole. For hundreds, if not thousands of years, the church has operated with a structure that is actually different from the one that Yeshua gave us through the apostles and prophets. These gifts are known to us as the fivefold. And they've been given by the Lord for the body to be prepared and trained up into the works of the ministry. But in their place, mostly, and this is really important, the old wineskin, the current church, has been only operating in two of these streams. Those being pastor, and teacher with the gift of evangelism showing up every now and then. And just imagine, I'm gonna give you uh, a, an image here of a large flow of water with two outlets and one with five. Two flows of water, one that has two outlets, one that has five. Which one moves faster and more efficiently? And what happens when the water gets backed up as a result of the lesser flow? Similarly, if an engine was built to operate on five cylinders and is only using two, it's blocked from running to its full potential and capacity. Plus, the two cylinders take on way too much of the work and they become strained. Sound familiar? Need I say any more? Generally speaking, this is the state of the old wineskin. Plus, the old wineskin, I got this from my brother Kevin Jessup from The Return just recently. The old wineskin promotes an inward focus within the four walls of the church, while the new wineskin has an outward focus of the gospel, of healing and restoration and evangelism to reach and affect the world around us. And because the fivefold have already been released in us through Yeshua, they're naturally a part of us. They're in our DNA, whether we like it or not. Yet, because they are not able to flow freely, they're being stifled. And the church is suffering greatly as a result. In the old wineskin, the leaders do most of the ministry work, right? And the saints are too pew-bound. In the new wineskin, prayer and worship are its foundation, providing the spiritual fuel to release the body into the works of the ministry. And the leaders prepare the saints of God to be trained through the unique gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us, which is inclusive of the fivefold. Now, it's easy to talk about the fivefold, but it's extremely challenging when thinking about trying to fix it. Also, many believe in the fivefold, but are still not working on their application. And I think that's true, especially for a lot of the charismatic part of the church and some of, of the non-charismatic part of the church as well. And I'm not suggesting for a moment again that I've got all the answers here, but I feel compelled to address this issue. I have many leaders pull endorsements from Romans 911 because I wouldn't drop these chapters in the book. And my response was, I can't take these out because this is an intricate part of the restoration. And I feel compelled to 
bring it up as an issue because we must enter into dialogue and healthy debate to find ways through these issues to release the body into greater levels of authority, greater structure that Yeshua has already established that we have to just rediscover. And this will include the body that is already operating in the fivefold. Perhaps they need to become more sensitive to the rest of the body that is having issues holding them back. And we're going to talk about some of those. So let's try to define these gifts as well as how they can operate in governance through the body. And in the chapter about the fivefold in Romans 9 1, 1 apostolic foundations, I have been more detailed and diplomatic in my approach for the body's greater consideration. And I would encourage you to read that chapter. Plus, I've listed some excellent books and teachings on the fivefold. In this study guide, I want to be more direct to simplify the process, to help us to find a solution to the many challenges that are currently holding us back. I'm drinking, I don't know about you, but I'm drinking my tea right now. It's almost four o'clock, I'm an I'm a Englishman. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, let's look at how the fivefold is defined. Who or what is an apostle? An apostle is one who is sent with strategic vision and purpose. What or who is a prophet? One who sees hidden insight and perspective. Who or what is an evangelist? One who saves, bring God's news, has a greater desire for the lost. What is a pastor? Or who is a pastor? One who shepherds, nurtures, and cares. And who or what is a teacher? One who scores, equips the saints. So it may help us here to break the fivefold into two parts. And I think this is really necessary because there's a lot of confusion about how these gifts work and how they actually operate. But again, really praying on this and drilling down, I think the Lord broke it down clearly for me for these two focuses. And one has to do with function and the second is governance. We need greater clarity to understand the greater picture with these two focuses. So before I start though, I want to make clear that Yeshua actually operated in every gift of the fivefold. He was the apostle. He was the one who was sent. He was the prophet, the one to come and the one who sees. He was the evangelist to the lost and the one who saves. He was the great shepherd. And he was a teacher, the one who scores. So let's look at function. In this light, when we become saved and connected to the Lord, these gifts are, begin to flow through us to realize his plans and purposes in each of our lives. We learn from the Apostle Paul in Corinthians that we are one body with many parts, right? And as a result, I believe that each of us are equipped with different gifts, and that includes all of us. Similarly, we can move in a number of these different gifts, but usually what we'll find is that one or two of these gifts will play a more prominent role in our spiritual, on our personal spiritual DNA, depending on what it is, and also depending on what it is the Lord is calling us into with the ministry focus that he has for us. And it's important to note that the fivefold gifts operate at all levels of the church and ministry. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say that again. You've got to get this one. It's important to note that the, 
the fivefold gifts operate at all levels of the church and ministry, from the layperson to church leaders to regional leaders and national and global leaders. And I want to give you some examples here to drill it down a little bit. For example, if you were starting a new ministry, couldn't this be considered apostolic? If you see visions, receive prophetic insights, and can interpret dreams, could this be prophetic? If you have a deeper burden for the lost than most of us, because we all should have a burden for the lost, this could be evangelistic. If you operate with greater care and concern for others, this could be considered pastoral. And if you have a desire to equip the body, this could be regarded as teaching. I want to talk about my own experience here for a moment. In my own ministry focus, again, to help us to unpack this. My lead gift when people ask me in the fivefold is as a prophetic intercessor. This is where the Lord has me most and where I'm most comfortable and free to operate. However, in leading reconnecting ministries, I operate in an apostolic gifting coupled with prophetic and teaching gifts to help bring this message forth. Pastor Bernie is a great example because he's a fiery evangelist, right? moving in the gifts of evangelism. I'm also a board member and partner of the 10 Days Prayer Ministry Movement, which was founded by Jonathan Frizz. Now, in this particular case, Jonathan operates in the role in the apostolic. In 10 days, I support him more in a prophetic role and I've had to learn the difference. Sometimes I've overstepped my boundaries because I may have been moved, moving over into the apostolic rather than the support role that I'm called to in the prophetic to come alongside. And in that case, we, we, would, uh, we, we would begin to experience some friction. And I've had to learn that experience by trial and error, which is how all of us learn the ministry gifts. But keying into my gifting has helped me better to recognize this place and to serve in, in 10 days, in particular in this case, and to serve Jonathan and the Lord in how I've actually been called. But I'm never going to call myself an apostle or a prophet, even if I'm still moving in operating in the gifts. But if anyone asks what my gifts are, I will do my best to explain how I may operate in the different gifts of the fivefold and hopefully with liberty to live and work out my calling. Does that make sense? However, I do believe that there is one major exception to this, and that has to do with those leaders that are called to regional, national, and global areas. Because I think it's really important for us to be able to recognize the giftings that these men and women are moving into or are operating in already so that we can support and release them and bless them into their gifting. Because it will release greater clarity, greater authority, and greater direction from heaven. And this is where I think God will be able to further impact regions and national leaders to help them to move into these roles. And while those moving in an apostolic and prophetic gifting don't need to use titles, I think this titling issue is a problem. It's a red flag. 
and it's causing a lot of the body to get stumped because they're looking at it and saying, you know, it, it's the wrong approach. Are you with me there? Yes. Amen. Amen. So the second aspect that I want to focus on is governance. This is most probably the greatest challenge in this area and where most of the confusion and resistance actually comes into play. But I believe, beloved, we must find a way through these challenges. We must be able to begin to overcome these areas of misunderstanding and especially through prayer and intercession that is going to lead the way. These barriers and obstacles relate much more to the apostolic and the prophetic giftings than to any of the other fivefold focuses. In particular, how we refer and relate to them. But I think it's relevant to point out that the apostolic and prophetic giftings definitely carry more weight in the church. The church is built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophet of which Mashiach Christ is the cornerstone. And this makes sense because ministry is built upon vision and purpose and vision and purpose is released through the apostolic and prophetic giftings in the body. But it's also important to point out that one is not greater than the other. All are needed to make the body complete. And in my mind, apostles and prophets work much better as a team. Apostles need prophets to see more clearly. Prophets need apostles for overall vision. And where would we be without evangelists, pastors, and teachers in the church? In addition, as I've already mentioned, we can operate with more than one of these gifts. But in most cases, one or two of them will be more prominent. A good example of this would be Chuck Pierce from Glory of Zion. Chuck's lead gift is prophetic, but he moves apostolically to bring it forth in his own community and nationally and globally as the Lord leads. In Alan Hirsch's book, This is a Must Read for the Fivefold, it's called 5Q. And on page 94, he cites numerous past church leaders who operated with lead giftings. Let me read some of them to you. St. Patrick, Apostle, Shepherd. Francis of Assisi, Prophet, Apostle. John Wesley, Apostle, Prophet. John Calvin, Teacher. Catherine Booth, Apostle. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Prophet, Teacher. George Whitfield, evangelist. Billy Graham, evangelist. Mother Teresa, shepherd. Martin Luther King, prophet. Beginning to get the picture. These gifts are in us. They're in all of us. And God has, uh, wants us to, uh, to, to be released in how these gifts function and operate, but also how we respect and honor the various giftings that are being released in the body to help the structure and organization of the church. And this is going to become vital in this restoration because through it, the Father will be able to release greater levels of authority. So there's, there are things at stake here. So before, before I go any further, I want to address the stepping stones before we get more detailed into the governance uh, that I think will help to, to break it down. And here I've outlined five points. The fivefold gifts are given to serve the body. Two, we cannot be self-proclaimed 
those moving, and I'm him, hear me, I'm not calling them apostles or prophets. I'm saying, listen to my terminology. Those moving in apostolic and prophetic anointings need to be recognized by those whom they are serving. Hallelujah. But we are still human, and there is no question here that ego can play a role. The flesh is wicked, guys. Come on, we're dealing with it every day. I can't believe some of the things that come through this brain. Help. Help me, Lord. Hallelujah. Titles can go to our heads, which is the exact opposite to the directive that the Lord has given us in how we are supposed to serve. Moving forward, could we not create certain guidelines in how the apostolic and the prophetic are actually recognized and come into a wider agreement on it? I am pleased to report this year that Tikkun International Ministries is one of the, the ministries that is trying to, to, to help in this area and that has really taken the lead. They have responded so well with love and care and have been under a great deal of attack in the last couple of years from the rest of the body in Israel because they are a ministry moving in the fivefold and yet with humility and servitude they have responded and they have put out this document it's called of affirmations and confessions concerning apostolic and prophetic ministry with a greater call to humility purity and integrity in the charismatic renewal. Now, I know that's a long title, guys, but it's so significant. The points that they make in the title are so key to exactly what it is, the spirit that the Lord is looking to inject into this release of the fivefold so that it will help to open the door to bring the rest of the body into it, break down those barriers and and help us feel freer in how we move in these gifts. Hallelujah. And it's really a blessing to see Tikkun as a messianic apostolic ministry give us this, this, uh, this documentation. And I would really encourage you to read it. We've got to be more careful with terminology here. For the sake of the rest of the body, listen, we're called to live at peace and unity in love with our family. And if part of our family has got real problems with the apostolic moving in terminology and names and stuff like that, I want to be sensitive to that. And I have to tell you, it's caused me to repent. I have changed my tune. I used to promote the fact that we need to get over the naming issue, but I've changed my mind because I want to be sensitive to the other part of the body and I want to help to address the, the terminology that may be giving them issues because, because ultimately the, those that are called into these positions are called to a greater level of service than the rest of us. So for this reason, I, I, I want to suggest to you ways that we can still achieve the Lord's objective by moving and operating in apostolic and prophetic giftings while also being able to communicate where and when needed. And so the first question, which we briefly touched on, is, is it absolutely necessary to say or call oneself an apostle? or a prophet. What are you after? On the other hand, we should not, and here comes the balance, okay? Because, and this balance is key, we should not be shy or reluctant because of these issues to step into the roles and callings that the Lord is leading us into for his plans or purposes, because if we don't, who suffers? 
The kingdom suffers because we're not operating and moving into the role and the position the Lord has called us into. So there's a balance here. So instead, could we not consider the following? In place of the actual name and title, when asked, could we not say that this particular place, I'm moving in an apostolic or prophetic gifting to achieve the Lord's plans and purposes? Could we not say, for example, Brian or Susan are moving in our group apostolically or prophetically and then support it? Whatever may be appropriate to describe the function and the governance they are moving in to serve the ministry. The challenge presently in many church arenas is that certain leaders are reluctant to use any type of terminology because of this issue. But what that is doing is preventing the Lord from releasing those leaders into a greater aspect of the ministry call and those that are called around them to support. We've got to find a breakthrough because a cog is in the wheel and it needs to come out. And it needs to be removed so that we are released into the calling and the direction that the Lord has us for us in these ministry focuses. Regional leaders are already moving in these types of roles. There are pastors meetings all over this country and in many other nations in the world, I'm sure. But by empowering them more precisely into these giftings and recognizing the gifts will help to serve the body and release us into a more effective place in our communities. Can we consider ways to achieve this without ego and self-promotion coming into play? The fivefold does not replace leadership in the church. There's a clear footprint for elders and deacons in scripture and it's not one or the other, but both. And here I want to present to you a controversial character, Peter Wagner. But I bless by this brother because he took a lot of the flack and attack from the body, but really has plowed, plowed the ground in this area to bring greater definition to the callings of apostle and prophet and the other gifts in the body. And one of the teachings he's done, or he did many years ago before he passed, was the differences between an apostolic center and a church. And I think in this restoration, there is a place for both regular church, but some churches are called to a greater focus. They're hubs for greater ministry focus to be released into the community, into the region, and could be the nation. And this doesn't put the church environment in a negative light, but rather to point out the differences between the two focuses. And for sure, in these days, God is raising up apostolic centers for his church. And while we've already addressed the fivefold gifts in individuals, it's important to understand that these gifts also operate corporately at every level of ministry. They operate within the local church as well as regionally and nationally and globally. And it's essential to separate the two to be able to see how they actually operate more clearly. Your pastor, for example, may or may not have a pastor's gifting. They could have a teacher or evangelistic gift, which is their leading. However, in more effectively recognizing each of their equipping gifts, they can bring on others in the church to fulfill the other roles 
and calling in the fivefold to round out the church focus. And if they're not apostolic or prophetic, they can connect to other ministries to fill those voids, to empower the church. The walls of the church have got to come down in this, this reconnection and reformation time. We've got to begin to gather as community and unite together. And this can happen both locally, nationally, and even globally. The HIM network I am personally associated with through Cheon actually has a national and global focus with many thousands of ministries, thousands of ministries around the world because of the gifting that HIM has. And in particular, Che An has this, this apostolic gift to release others into the work of ministry and to create that un an umbrella for them to come in and release them. And it's just amazing to see these apostolic ministries that the Lord is raising up during these days and to see the fruit that is coming from them and especially the growth which is substantially higher when you compare it to regular church and finally we must have liberty here and be led by his spirit in how these gifts are applied and exactly who the Lord leads us to be connected with the key, however, I believe is to no longer accept the status quo of the old wineskin and begin to press in for the change and the reformation that is coming to the body of Messiah. Now that we've briefly discussed how the fivefold gifts can operate in the church environment, let's take a look at how they can function regionally, nationally, and globally. And this is where I believe the most significant differences are made with fivefold ministry, not just to switch our focus from an inward approach, but to an outward plan, but also to release the apostolic and prophetic gifting amongst and through our leaders to establish greater works of unity for the local church to more effectively reach the lost and reach the community. And this will not only help to release more significant works of evangelism, but the pastors and teachers when this takes place will be so busy teaching and equipping the body. And prayer and worship will play a major role for this to take place and especially how it's organized in our local communities and beyond those four walls I want to see those walls come down so that we can come together in our communities in a greater way there is however a major stumbling block here which i've touched on briefly regarding moving into the new wineskin and the fivefold that I've addressed. And this has to do with attendance in the local church with the old wineskin. Presently, which in most cases is dwindling and especially now with COVID. And there is a huge spirit of fear attacking the local church and specifically its leaders because of loss of attendance and dwindling tithe and it causes them to be focused on these things rather than building others' kingdom. And here, rather than point the finger and rather than be critical or judgmental, we must humble ourselves and stand in the gap for our pastors to hold up their arms and strengthen them that they would become more secure and confident in their calling and build the church as the Lord is calling them to build. And could it be that the church has been operating too much like the world when it actually comes to finances. Yes. I think so. And there must be repentance here on all church leadership. First, 
The children of God need to be led by the Holy Spirit where they go to church and where they place their tithe. And second, if God is building the house, we need to trust him to do it. And this is often one of the ways that God will get our attention that something needs to change. And I believe God's knocking at the door of the old wineskin. And, and they're experiencing some of these problems and these challenges because he's wanting to show them a new way, a new path, adjustments and modifications that need to come into the body for our health and strength and well-being. So often this will cause the church to become more seeker focused rather than preaching and teaching the kingdom of God. After all, what are we building here? Successful churches or the kingdom of God? And pray God as we begin to embrace and adapt new wineskin principles, we will not have to worry about provision. We must become free and trust the Lord in this place and intercede and seek the Lord to find freedom and deliverance until we do. I believe God will also bring reform to our finances in this reformation and restoration and break off the influence that Babylon has had over the church. And I'm aware of leaders in the body of Christ, who the Lord is preparing for this very purpose. The spirit of fear causes churches to build up the walls around us in such a way that we become fearful of other churches in our communities, stealing away our sheep. God help us in this place, but honestly, these are the issues the pastors deal with. I'm telling you, right down to the brass tacks. It's about the sheep and the tithe. And we need to pray for them to get free in this place. And the larger churches are also guilty of this individualism, trying to offer every type of program so sheep remain in the four walls. And I can say this as a Jewish believer coming into the church, especially into the Protestant side of the church, that this is one of our greatest weaknesses in the Protestant movement. We end up with thousands of little kingdoms all around us instead of building the Lord's church which should have a far more significant impact and influence on our communities. This is not how the original church operated. They had many smaller body of believers, but then they came together as community. And similarly, when Yeshua spoke to the churches in the book of Revelations, he addressed the body in each city, each main area where they lived. And speaking frankly, we need to be able to get back to start having a greater impact on our communities and local bodies that is united in Mashiach, in Christ. This is where the influence of the fivefold can truly impact us with a regional influence. We will begin in this time to focus more on regions so that the local churches can come together and the walls of the church can come down and we can unite in our communities and pray and support our prayer houses, which I'm going to speak more about uh, in the strategy session when I talk about harp and bowl and 24 seven prayer. I wanna focus a little bit about this regional influence because I, I think this is where we can have a greater impact. And to a certain extent, these leaders are already being raised up. We need to help recognize them and release them. 
pastors reaching out to pastors and praying together. But if we can look to define these groups and empower them to reach other local leaders to help bring greater unity to the body, then we can more effectively break into the community and break into the area around us with the emerging prayer focus that the Lord has established right in the context of this fivefold. And if we can do this in such a way without creating a hierarchy to that leadership that is always open to new leaders and fresh gifting coming into the fold and always feeling welcome and embraced, then the possibility may arise for us to create opportunities to rebuild this love and unity beyond the four walls of the local church. This is another way that the fivefold gifts can be used to expand unity and reach out beyond. Fivefold can make a major difference here in how the body is organized and structured. It is among these groups and these environments that their peers begin to recognize apostolic and prophetic giftings among them. I go to these leaders' meetings all over the place. I can pinpoint those moving the apostolic and prophetic within 20 to 30 minutes of listening to them dialogue with each other. And it's important for us to be able to recognize those men and women and release them Can we consider blessing what Yeshua has already created in his body by acknowledging and releasing these leaders into their roles to achieve God's plans and objectives? Simply put, the possibilities are endless to the greater love and unity that can be achieved, which we begin to put together as these pieces come together, we begin to see the greater picture. And this also applies to global and national influences of the fivefold, which God is already raising up. I hope Kansas City, for example, is a perfect example of a national and global apostolic ministry in the fivefold. Hillsong in Australia is another one in mind, glory of Zion in Corinth, HIM in Pasadena, Bethel Ministries. I'm talking about mainly the American ones. Tiku in America on the Messianic side. And there are many others, especially in the nations that I haven't mentioned. But what's unique about these ministries is that they focus on a particular part of ministry with a global focus, releasing it to the body. And a lot of us in this room and listening to this video are being drawn to that because we're hungry to be equipped and released. For example, IHOP's focus is on 24-7 prayer. Hillsong is reaching younger believers. Glory of Zion imparts the prophetic. HIM has an apostolic covering. Bethel focuses on music ministry. And there are many others that I have not mentioned. During the 21st century, many of these ministries have become apostolic hubs for their individual ministry focus, and God has raised them up and has blessed them. And many believers are being drawn to them because they are helping to equip us for the works of the ministry. They are breaking ground in each of these ministry areas and helping to set footprints for the rest of the body. This is what apostolic and prophetic ministries are supposed to do. Hallelujah. And it's interesting to note that a number of these ministries, the ones I've mentioned, carry a particular piece of the Israel restoration and as a result, I'm mightily blessed. IHOP encourages prayer for Israel. Glory of Zion promotes Jewish roots. 
Gateway Church in Dallas, Texas, is helping the church understand how to shepherd Jewish believers. Gateway also teaches on the first fruits revelation in tithe and offering that should go back to the remnant. And as I end this session, I want to emphasize how crucial it is for the church to re-embrace fivefold giftings. We must come to understand that there is simply so much more for us to gain by adopting these gifts and leaving the status quo behind us rather than sticking to the old wineskin that is beginning to dry up. It is our leadership that needs to make these changes in our churches, but it is up to the remnant to stand in the gap for them and to love them and to contend for them and to cry out that they would be touched and restored and the enemy's influences would be broken off. For our battle is not with flesh and blood, but with spirits and principalities for the pulling down of strongholds. And we must contend for the leadership in the church that is stuck in the old wineskin, that these barriers get broken off and the gates are opened up to them to move into this restoration, like with the rest of us. So can we agree to pray for them, to have courage to face these issues, but also for the challenges and the obstacles to be removed to help open the doors. Abba, we come before you. Thank you for leading us into this reconnection. Lord, help us to embrace the changes that you are desiring and needing for us to enter into during these days. Lord, help us to love one another. Help that love to flow to the point that we can talk to each other and dialogue and find your heart for these changes especially with our end time perspective, that we would not be so hung up that we would miss the very heart of this restoration. And that Lord, you would help us to find ways through with this fivefold issue, that as you're restoring your church relationally to its Jewish roots and heritage with the remnant of Israel. Lord, this is where the fivefold was given and was released through an apostolic body that brought your gospel out into the nations. And it's now time for us in the nations to bring it back to Israel. But that Lord, that you would help us to Refind the order and the governance that you established for the empowering and for the releasing and for the equipping of your body to do the works of the ministry and to fulfill your call here on the earth. We'll give you all the honor and all the glory in the matchless name of your son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. 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 Rant. Can you hear me, Grant? Yes. Hey, so uh, thank you for sharing uh, your video about this critical matter. Before we go into the new breed of business interpretation of this, could you give us the lens of how this relates to the one new man? So why is it critical for us to have this governance of the fivefold back restored 
in order to see the one new man fulfilled. Everything that the reconnection ministry is about, how does that tie into this message? I don't think I don't think it's so much that um it has to come about for the reconnection message. I think these are two significant focuses. And if I can add a third coming out of Babylon, that are major parts of the reform that these are different pieces. Remember in the, the video, the Romans 911 video, where we show the puzzles, the pieces of the puzzle coming together. The father is moving significant pieces together as part of this reform that make up the whole. And as we discussed earlier today, Greg, without the governance and the proper authority flowing in the church, we won't have the, the flow. But if you can imagine that the apostolic and prophetic leadership, along with the pastors, evangelists, and teachers, have the reconnection message, and they have coming out of Babylon message, okay, that they are able to begin to to release it in 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 a greater way into their communities and into the church as a whole so um there is a rebuilding process you know that's why the lord's given us this picture of nehemiah because nehemiah was called to rebuild the walls of jerusalem i'm convinced that part of the major part of this reform is the, the church is called, the Lord is calling us to rebuild the church. And, and these are significant pieces that are linked together. It's not like the reconnection will bring the fivefold, or, but the fivefold can properly implement and teach and instruct and outline and guideline coming out of Babylon. Uh, coming into the reconnection and, and alignment message so that they are significantly linked, but it's not like the fivefold would necessarily bring about the one you man, if that, if you understand where I'm coming from. Yeah. What I'm really trying to drive at is would you, would it not be fair to say that for the fullness of what God wants to bring both in the reconnection and in the coming out of Babylon and into the kingdom Role, realm of economics we'll never get there if we don't to the fullness if we don't have this leadership structure and governance in place is that a fair statement that is absolutely a fair part of the that remember there's a strategy god has given us in romans 9 1 1 the message comes first mainly to the watchman gives them vision and insight that we know how to pray for the rest of the church that feeds the remnant. The remnant and the watchmen stand in the gap for the rest of the church until the leadership, uh, until the leadership comes into and embraces these different pieces and begins to to implement them and and pastor and shepherd them. They will not take in the church in a, in a in a wider sense. But there's a strategy here for us first the uh, these are not top-down messages these are coming to those that are closer to the heart of the lord the watchmen that are on the walls we have uh the lord is in giving us insight increasing our knowledge and revelation what are we going to do with it we need to take it and with faith see the church change that the lord is going to change okay maybe not the whole church is going to come into this we already see a great deal of the church falling away, but but the Lord's body is going to rise during this time, and that body will be reformed. That body will carry the reconnection. That body will will not will will have the influences of, of Babylon broken off it, and and moved into deeper places of repentance. This is this is where we're going, um, and so. These are significant pieces and parts of, of the puzzle. Yeah, so I think um, two of the areas you say that are perhaps the greatest obstacles and hindrances to achieving this, to coming out of the old wineskin and into the new, uh, is, is essentially, if you really look at it, a matter of the flesh versus the spirit. If we're operating in the spirit, we're going to let God 
have his way with us and with others. When we're operating in the flesh and the way the world works, everything has to be under our command and control. And you mentioned these two attributes of attendance and money or ties, as you called it. So in the old model, in the old wineskin, which is really a kind of a carryover from the Roman Empire and the Christianization of the Roman Empire, it's often a pyramid structure where the pastor or a leader at a church is in charge. And they're the matter of the saints at the church are oftentimes looked at as you are the consumers of my product. This church develops a product and you can purchase it by giving. And if you do, then you're, you know, you're doing God's will. Um, but what you have here is the matter of the Nicolaitans, which is talked about in Revelation 2 and 3, the control of the laity and the money, which is the big Reformation issue uh, of the Protestant Reformation. And so these two areas from, um, from a biblical perspective require great humility and trusting in God to come out of. Because the fivefold doesn't operate as a pyramid. It operates as uh, concentric circles that touch one another. It operates as a network. It operates more as an organism. Um, and it's, you know, we last week, for example, we spoke about on the New Breed of Business with uh, Dale Schlafer, the OMC example. So in Bradenton, Florida, there are eight counties who are coming together in a new wineskin um they very much are exhibiting this example and they have a chart that shows how the role of elders and the fivefold ministers that you spoke of in your teaching they're at the bottom of this chart and so it shows you it's upside down you mentioned the upside down kingdom why is it upside down because in order to enter into this we can't control the laity and receive of their monies to keep the engine going and we run it as the world might run a business or might run um, an army or something, uh, it has to be in the model of the way Jesus act, acted. So, for example, like the apostles uh, of Acts that you speak of and Jesus, they never went to the laity and asked them for money. They didn't say, hey, you got to keep this ministry going uh God's uh, the Father's only given me three years to accomplish this work, said Jesus. So we're going to pass out the plate and you can give unto this great ministry. Uh, no, he never did that. And the apostles the same way. They never raised money for themselves. They received people's generosity as moved by the Spirit. And that's the difference like in the way the world works. Just like, listen, I've got a market to you. I've got to tell you how it is and control you. And that's not the way of the kingdom. It's not the way of servanthood. It's not the way of truly receiving and giving. If you look at modern examples, for example, you have um, George Mueller, who specifically knew from his experience growing up with his father that it was wrong to use the church platform as a way of manipulating people into money or resources to keep things going. That if it truly were God, he would move on the hearts of men and provide in other ways. And it would not be a command and control type of way of operating. And in that, you have to humble yourself, right? Because you have to trust God and not trust in your abilities to go run everything or finance everything. So these are kind of these fundamental economic principles that we talk about in the new breed of business. And we, it, it, we're going to have these hindrance and obstacles, are we not? until we change our way and truly trust God, uh, which is what the model is of the Acts Church. You just, like you're talking about naming convention of ego or pride, or like, I'm going to call myself a super leader, super apostle, super prophet, um, and put it on my business card to attract, you know, attention or followers or influence or money. Paul spoke of that he is an apostle, and he did that out of what? Out of his, out of his testimony with his audience, he had the ability to say that. There, you know. But as you're saying, like, how many people really can say that where their audience would 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 come into agreement? So it's better to humble ourselves and let others say that of us rather than 
state claims and say, I, I'm this, I'm that, you need to do this, you need to do that. Um, yeah. Just look at that great example there. Go ahead, brother. You can say I'm moving apostolically to, you know, uh, move in this particular ministry. You can, you know, and we suggest those, those changing our terminology. And, and to a certain extent, we need to pray for the body that's already trying to break through in the fivefold. God bless them. At least they're, at least they're trying to do it. Hallelujah. Okay. They may be making mistakes, trial and error, but we also need to pray for them to perhaps give up some of the, you know, the naming part. Okay. Because there's no question that the ego, that the flesh, it just so easily gets us attached to that stuff. So, and that, you know, the truth is apostolic and prophetic leaders are, are called to the ministry of the town. They're called to serve the body in a greater way. They have a greater, you know, responsibility you know, with the gifts that God has given them and the, the perhaps the five or ten cities that he's given them in, in light of the weight of the gifting that they're carrying. And um, we need to pray for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the other things that we as a body have to come out of on both sides, so this is a both sides issue, right? Because it's not just, well, you as leaders maybe are doing things of the world. It's us as followers too that, that can be in, what are they, enabling this behavior where we say, yeah, yeah, I want my programs. I want my scripture this way. I want a really good uh, preacher or pastor who feeds me. So I'll, I'm willing to pay for that. And that's part of that mindset we've got to get out of, which is, again, back to a world way of looking at things. I mean, we are not, are we not the royal priesthood? There's, we have to get rid of this distinction between the professionals and the others. And the professionals are professional ministers. So we as others or anyone as others has to fund that by earning a wage and then funding the pros. And that gets in the way of this fivefold ministry because part of the OMC example, part of the reason that God has highlighted in that region is because many of the elders and many of the fivefold ministers are not official professional ministers. They're people on the board of education, the uh, city council, uh, they're business people in the community. Uh, they're, they're, some are pastors and some are other leaders. And so this, this helps us illustrate and understand that the way that God does this is he is the one who calls. He is the one who provides. So as we flow and enter into him and that by the spirit, rather than by the flesh or I have a building, I have a budget, I have to keep it going. Um, we have the freedom for God to use us in a greater fashion. And I think that's as part of this humility is the recognition of that. Amen. Hey, does anybody uh, else want to uh, jump into this discussion and have any questions or, or comments? Oh, um, there's Antoinette. She's laughing. <laughs> no, I was laughing because Angela and I pressed our <laughs> mute and open at the same time. Ding. Um, so, so I just want to make um, a, um, a broad sort of uh, comment about the first century. You know, um, the heart of God was to create this priesthood, this wonderful, uh, the whole of the Old Testament is his relationship with his people. And, and um, you know, how, how we human beings should relate to God. And, and the disobedience, the flesh, got into everything so often <laughs> that um, when he sent his son, the whole leadership structure was not listening. 
it was just the the nobodies who were listening and the fishermen, the fishermen and the yeah the people from galilee rather than from jerusalem so plebeians so the the heart of the father was always to have this function but the flesh the flesh the flesh flesh is flesh and i cannot stand in the presence of the lord but we're so we've anyway so the lord then once he once he brought and birthed salvation into the world put it into the hands of these nobodies um gave them his spirit you know and went back to the father but the judgment was on the whole structure he removed them i mean the devastation was complete the the land was was brought into utter ruin the city was completely uh, the temple the city i mean we're in my view we are on the verge of that kind of uh, pronouncement and result because of this false structure of pandering to the flesh and giving flesh titles and you can be a pope and still be flesh it doesn't make any difference to the lord what makes a difference to the lord is who's who's obedient to his voice and uh, and and doing what he's asked them to do mm. um and so you know i mean that's just um i'm i'm not anyway yeah that's my feeling and i don't hear in the church this incredible warning i know that grant you say it's time to sound the alarm but it really is uh, 9/11 was a huge alarm, alarm that went off in america 20 what 25 years ago what yeah 20. but very little you know it's ones and twos it's not great it's not you know all the people who are in position, who are in fact blocking the flow of the Holy Spirit. It's like the people have to come out of the, you know, they went out to meet Jesus and he went out in the highways and the byways, you know. He left the structure, well, he didn't. He kept on in the structure. But, you know, I just feel that there is, um, um, trying to trying to keep something that, that, that I think the COVID was another example of how the Lord put a spoke in the wheel. The Lord put the spoke in the wheel because he wants change. He wants us to have an opportunity to, to, to really call upon him and to change the way we do things. Anyway, that's that's um, just a comment. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, you know, it's like the so we you know these things are going to happen because Jesus said that he uh, would receive a bride without spot or wrinkle. Now, how he gets us there, that's his sovereign desire. So you can get we can get. Uh, come up with our own ways of thinking about that and so forth, but he's going to have his way. So, you know, what we can't do in the process is denigrate the old wine skin. That's why we have the scripture that we do that says, uh, preserve the old wine for those who tasted the new, do not like it. Um, but continue into the new wine skin and I'll release the new wine. So I think what, what God is helping us understand there in that is it's not our job to point out or, you know, condemn those who are loving the new wine. I mean, the old wine, let the old wine be honored, let the old wine uh, stay, but you can't get to where God is going unless you enter into the new wineskin. 
And so all we could do is promote and warn like they're, you know, they're the old wine skin is not going to continue. It's going to be this new wine skin. And then can people debate, well, what is it? Is it, you know, my view of things, your view of things? It's Jesus's view of things. We enter into that through humility and grace and trumpet this message and warn uh, without writing off or condemning which by the way the one of the great enemies to the new wineskin which we had experienced for example here in fairfield county we had a church of fairfield county there's a whole story behind it i could get into but one of the things that killed it was the relational um breakdown and accusations and false accusations and just uh, whatever you want to say strife divisions you know in Galatians 5, we see this great list of the works of the flesh, the works of the spirit. We can't enter into this skin in the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. It can only be of the spirit, which is very, you know, you you read through those attributes of the fruits of the spirit, which are the characteristics of God. They're very humble. Um, they're not like we're going to, you know, punish those who are not in, who are in the old wine skin or, or somehow, uh, you know, come against um, them. So it's like our our job is to warn, but there will be a great falling away. That's prophesied in the scripture. Our job is to trumpet and herald the Lord's return and to enter into this new wineskin. And then it's up to God as to how people make those decisions. But we, it's almost as though we, the church that's responding to the Holy Spirit, um just can have to continue on and preach this message and let the spirit sort those things out so um yeah Grant, let me, any, uh, yeah, let me there? Add to that. yeah let me add to that greg um we have to be careful knowledge is a dangerous thing we have to be careful with the knowledge and revelation the lord gives us because the enemy can come at us to point the finger and be critical and there is a, you've often heard me say, there's a reversal here of the one and the 99. The Lord says constantly to me, I love my church. And, you know, there are many of us that are blind, that have been blinded to this message. And the Lord is lifting that blindness. Just think back for a moment. There are most of us on this call of uh, older, older believers with the gifts of the Holy Spirit being released through the charismatic renewal just think though how long that actually took the challenge uh that many leaders had in those days the splits that it caused in various churches and various bodies these teachings are coming these reforms are coming and it calls it requires from us love patience and gentleness the fruit of the spirit you know and that's why the lord has given us the directive with the two hands because we love in the natural that is how the lord loves the love the lord loves those that are still blinded to these areas he loves them just the same way he loves us is uh, and and so we have to love with an unconditional love but the other hand is to fight and so what do we do with the knowledge? What do we do with where people are at? How do we take it to the Father? You know, I'm I'm having some really serious conversations with, with the Lord at the moment, with some of these struggles, some of the leaders that are still resisting. You know, I'm I'm going there in the courts and I'm contending. I'm having conversation. And I'm, you know, and I'm asking, you know, at, but it constantly is calling me to a, a death in my own heart, you know, to be more patient and to be more gentle and to love unconditionally. And we have to lead by example. This is the heart of John 17. This is the fullness of John 17. We have to live it by example. So when the Lord gives us this insight and, and knowledge and revelation, he's giving it to us for a purpose because he wants us to partner with him for it to come 
to the rest. And we know it's slow. We know there's great obstacles. There's lots of resistance. We, we live around this every day of our lives. But his grace is sufficient, and it constantly brings the need for the cross in each of our own lives. So, um, you know, um, we are we are pressing into the goal and look what God's doing. I mean, look what he just did in this past Pentecost. And I was on a call. We just started doing a Romans 911 with IHOP uh, Eastern Gate. And we had quite a, a, a few young believers on the call and saying that he knew nothing about Israel. But after experiencing um, the Isaiah 62 fast and and the prayer for the salvation of Israel, like a light's gone on. They, 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 their testimony was, you know, I, I need to learn. I need to learn about this. So that's what, you know, we're doing with reconnecting ministries. We're creating a hub. That's what Greg's doing with Newbury, creating a hub for all the teachings and the focuses that people can come in and link. And in these coming days, eventually like that dam breaking and you all know that story that dam breaking in that movie it will be it will eventually gush but it's going to take a, a lot you know it's going to take a lot of love and a lot of patience and a lot of gentleness on behalf of the saints that the lord reveals these messages to to stand in the gap for the 99 sure. hallelujah and you know i think we I, I, rem, I recall, you know, this dream that the Lord gave me showing me that, you know, my pick for uh, a great leader or pastor or someone I admired or someone I who desired to come into a greater unity with other churches was not who God had selected. And so there was this in this dream, there was like so my version or what I thought was best for the unity of the church. But then God was revealing that the hearts were not as they appeared. And even if someone gave an incredible word of God or message, that did not necessarily mean they were close to God in their hearts. And only he can discern that. So basically, the whole point of that was coming out of a mall construct, like a shopping mall, and going to the airport. And that was symbolic of you've got to leave behind the way the world looks at the church, and you've got to enter into my spirit-led fueled uh body of and community of believers get with them get on the airplane don't miss the flight rather than trying to labor in something that isn't necessarily going to change because we can't we don't have the we don't have the mind of god and we don't know the hearts there's a scripture that only god knows the hearts of a man it, it may it may look good we our favorite leader might be someone who we think well wow if they became the apostle that would be amazing wouldn't it and god's saying no the apostles on the airplane and you didn't even know who they were they're they're not a very remarkable person to the flesh you know it's like the saul and the david issue so i think that's part of the key here is like lord what is you what are you doing let's go and get on board your airplane yeah um, let's not look to who we think or who who we would vote for as the next best uh, five-fold leader. And one caveat to that, in light of what Antoinette said, the shakings are here and they're only going to intensify. So we are just going to see the Lord bring about these purposes. And, and we don't, you know, the best thing for us to do is not try and figure out, you know, how this is going to come, but just keep plowing the field, you know, and yeah. the whole just going to take care of it, you know. And get up, yeah, and get on the airplane because if we're not on the spirit train, um, we're going to miss it. So, God, well, you know, God sorry, you know, the situation at the birth of uh, the birth of America was a, as a consequence of what happened here in religious persecution in this country. So you had. You had a very similar situation, didn't you, where, where the king and the, the leadership of the nation uh, was imposing a, a particular way of doing things. So you had the Puritans who wanted to stay within the church, but to 
but to fix the church, revive, uh, revive the church. They, then you had pilgrims who got on the boat and <laughs> they got on the boat, which is like the airplane, right? They got uh, yes, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So isn't there also the if you know the the yeah. I mean, we have to be he he hearing and following what the Lord is saying, because to some he's saying, get on the boat or the aeroplane. And, and, and to others he's saying, uh, stay and, and uh, fix this or work on it or do your best. I don't know. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, is it similar? Would you think it's similar? Yeah, are you highlighting that difference between those who were staying behind to try to affect Reformation and those who departed uh, believing that Reformation could not come? That's kind of the, di the difference between the Pilgrims and the Puritans. But the yeah. beautiful thing of God is that ultimately they both became Pilgrims because the Puritans left the Church of England and it was not Reformed, at least at that time. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that's There's always that way of God doing it but ultimately he's bringing us into the new yeah. He, yeah he gives us every chance right it's like Jesus longed as a mother wanted the uh, hen wanted the chicks to be gathered he, lo he longed for Jerusalem he longed for the temple to be restored he longed for the Jewish people but he recognized that the way of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes they couldn't get past their pride, their ego, their love of money, their attachments to those things that were going to be destroyed. And so there was the yeah. prophetic warning, there was the overturning of the tables, but there was ultimately the love and desire for that, but the plan of God of get on the airplane. In their case, it was get on the uh, persecution, Acts Church, the airplane of the fire falling in the upper room. Um, that was the new. Can Angela. I ask a question? Angela. Um, so, you know, on all those um, mega ministries you pointed out in your video, um, what is the diff? Are they, in your opinion, operating out of Babylon or they're operating in Babylon? Um, because as far as I understand, there's a pyramid structure there. And um, what is the difference between the storehouse hubs that Greg is talking about and the current apostolic hubs, which I have been part of, um, and uh, I don't see any difference between the apostolic hubs and, and the mega churches. They look the same. They operate the same from my understanding. Um, I may be wrong. Um, but the storehouse vision of coming out of Babylon is, is, a, is a, in my understanding of what Greg's saying, is that it's it's a different... It's not come here, bring your money. It is come here and give your money to help somebody, uh, to help somebody. I don't know if I'm asking the right questions. Um, I just, I just don't understand the the practical coming out of Babylon with apostolic hubs. I, I suppose that's the issue. Um, well, because... I, could, I could certainly answer that from my perspective, but Grant, you you named a number of ministries and Angela's saying, hey, are they still partly in Babylon? Um, I don't, I mean, I'd have, I, I don't, I don't know if I can answer that question because I'm, I'm, I'm just don't know how they flow in those places. I know many of them you know uh but just you know the f finance the finance is flowing to these ministries they're they're these these leaders are 
you know, mostly extremely busy just trying to manage the the um, the call that the Lord Lord has given them. Um, so um, I don't know. I th I think Greg, you you may be able to. I thought that was a, a really good question. Something, Great question. Yeah, we really. I I think I would like to know answer to that question too you know actually i'd like to know your opinion greg of you know um of that yeah i mean the way i'd answer it angela from my perspective which hopefully is god's informed perspective of the journey that i've been on um is this that just like peter wagner had a take on dominionism uh he he was entering into the knowledge and understanding and walking out at the first level of what god is talking about in terms of the fivefold gifting was it perfect i would say no was it to be succeeded by something that's closer to the true the truth of the fullness of the expression of who jesus is in the fivefold ministry Yes, it was meant to be succeeded. There's another ministry that I won't name where they received also, you know, insight about the dominionism. So dominionism comes from this terminology in the Bible, right? Take to Adam and Eve, you know, take take dominion over this garden. Um, and to Noah, when he came out of the ark with his family, take dominion over the earth, subdue it, multiply. So these are truths. Right. These are biblical truths. But where it gets distorted is if you just have that revelation and then you let it be a work of man, it just becomes a okay, we're in charge and we're gonna roll like the room, we're, we're gonna rule like the Romans do. And because we're Christian, we're in charge of everything. But that's not the intention of dominionism. So we have to move into the truth of what God is saying. Uh, so it's a progression, and there can be like movements towards the fullness of it, but they don't get fulfilled. Another example might be the Word of Faith movement. There were great truths in Kenneth Hagin's revelation about faith. But if you just stay there and you don't move with the Spirit on that airplane, it can get caught up in and taken over by the flesh and by man again. And so this, I think, is part of what we're seeing in any of these ministries. Only God knows like how close each ministry is to the new wineskin of where he's headed, but we know it's going to be a bride without spot or wrinkle, right? So God's not stopping his glory train um, and saying, hey, you guys got the first stage, but you didn't get the second, so I'll just wait until you get the second. I mean, he's going to continue on, and it's always a free will choice of every ministry, how they want to flow, every leader, how they want to flow, every saint and how they want to flow. Um, you could, so you could I would say, say there's a varying degree of where these ministries are at in terms of this wineskin. It, it it depends on the ministry. There's, for example, one particular ministry, again, without naming it, Grant and I have had many discussions. How do we get this Reformation message on the finance side to this ministry? How mm. can we accomplish that? And it's interesting because there is going to be opportunity to share that message. And then it's it, it's up to them. Everyone has a free will, right? So if God moves on the hearts of those leaders, they can enter into the more of the fullness of what God wants. So the storehouse is meant to represent and the storehouse network, this bride without spot or wrinkle vision of Jesus. There will be approaches to it. Versions one, versions two, versions three. There already are. We're prototyping this, right? But it's only if we stay in the spirit of the way the Lord is leading that we will get there. And that's true of any ministry. Um, but, you know, we could make argument for how each of those ministries we could criticize are not in the new wineskin. But instead of doing that, we just know where God is headed. It's he's the one leading. Jesus is leading here. It's our decision. Do we follow him? Will we follow him? And I think that just goes for the whole church. And the other dream that I had that related to this was expired prescriptions. There was a leader in this dream highlighted and God was warning me, be careful because this leader is now teaching out of his own flesh 
he had a inspiration and revelation from me in the beginning but that then has now become expired it was like he was a doctor wanting to prescribe expired prescriptions onto my wife in the dream and there was a wife swapping going on in this dream where god was saying like that's the false bride don't take that message don't take that bait so this is a very complex thing right a leader can get a revelation be moving in the ways of god and then go off track i mean we know that from moral failure for example but that could also be theologically true i remember listening to john paul jackson talking about john wimber's error in how he was pronouncing judgment i think over maybe the mike bickle movement or like i forget there was some wing of the church or it was maybe the toronto um gatherings like so any of us by the flesh can get it wrong only jesus has the truth and we just have to keep getting on board by the spirit of things and then when it all comes together we will have the axe church again you know we will have that level of kingdom uh model and skin and wine skin once more but it's certainly mm -hmm. a process and i think it's it requires great submission to the lord humility listening uh, being willing to buck the trends of men um, and so forth um, in, in a God-honoring fashion. Nancy, I think you had your hand up first. Go ahead. Yes, if I might just uh, share my experience uh, between church, all the churches that I've been, uh, and the one that I I've been blessed to attend to now, which is not a church to me. I can It's an apostolic hub. Um, and many of you might be familiar with uh, Glory of Zion. That's pretty much sort of like a, a portal. Everything is led by the Spirit. And so this church that I, this hub that I attend now is just the same. It's, it's fascinating. They will not move until the Spirit moves. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, we start with worship, of course, and it's not a big band or anything like that. There's just four people and we uh, listen to uh, uh, videos of music, uh, but we wait and, and, and we wait for the spirit and we worship and we worship and, and, and we press in if we feel that there's no breakthrough. And then at that point, um, it's open to what the spirit is doing. And then there's prophetic words or healings. It's just completely open. That can go be between, you know, an hour, two hours to three hours. And then uh, her husband comes up and will will uh, uh, do a teaching, you know, and that can go on for whatever. So my point is, it's just absolutely completely open to the spirit. There is no, there's no schedule like churches I've been to. It's like, okay, we worship for this long. Okay. Now is the message. Now is this, it's not like that at all. It, it, it It's completely led by the Holy spirit. Uh, and so it's a huge difference. It's just, it's a tremendous blessing to have found right. something like that, uh, particularly here in, in New Mexico. So that yeah, I just mean, wanted th to share. Thanks for sharing that, Nancy. I think the other thing too, is we can get too extreme one way or the other, too far to the left or right. And the, you know, if we're on the highway of holiness, we're in the place God wants us. And there's a ditch on the left and a ditch on the right. So we're not suggesting here, like just everything's willy nilly by the spirit, meaning uh, by the spirit is in the, in the context of the leadership and governance structure. So there's still order, there's still uh, honor, and it's, it's, it's like there's still a skeletal, you know, uh, way of God structuring this so that the spirit can be facilitated and paid attention to. So you know, yes. so, sometimes we get so rigid in our governance that it stifles the spirit. Sometimes we get so in the spirit that it's not the spirit anymore. It's the flesh and it's crazy and nutty and uh, there's no order to it. So this right. is addressed no, like no, in the I... scripture, remember, where it says, uh, I think it was the Corinthians. And there was the commentary Paul had of like, listen, you know, you need to do things in order. Things need to be decent. Like, the Holy Spirit, the, the spirit of the prophet is under control of the prophet. Don't forget that. So this is the right balance. Jesus is the one who knows this balance. He knows how they meant, they're meant to function together. And leadership, yes. the headship of Christ 
which is really the reflection of the fivefold ministry. It was upon Christ's ascension that he gave those gifts. Um, those, those are not um, gifts of, of um, being a wet noodle and having no backbone. That's not what humility means. Um, Jesus was the most humble person, was he not? But yet he had a backbone and he stood for righteousness. And I think that's you know critical to understand too. Yeah, thank you for that clarification because that's not the impression I wanted to give. But they, you know, they also have uh, artists that while the, the the they're they're preaching or giving the word, they're painting and yeah, so just awesome. things like that. But there is order to it. Uh, Great. Thank you. Just wanted to share my experience. Yeah, and it's it's really just for the help of everyone listening um, that we we talk about this, you know, being this this balanced by the Spirit of God. You know, Peter, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Hey guys, uh, I just I wanted to respond to that. I just from uh, the perspective that I've had of like just being a part of a bunch of different communities and the place that I've kind of had to resolve to in regards to the question about these big ministries, whether they're new ones or not, is like I've kind of I've had to just come to the the peace and the terms of like you know we're all doing the best we can with what we've been given, and you know these ministries if we want to point to different ones like I view them like a ship right. They're, they're meant to carry a certain number of people a certain distance or certain attract a certain people and they can carry them the distance that they're supposed to and just have to get to that place of resolving that they're doing the best they can with what they've been given and just as I am right because it's easy to get critical and say hey they're not doing it like me or I would do it differently or whatever but getting to that place of you know not not going to the pointing of the fingers or the criticalness and like just saying, hey, no, they're doing the best they can with what they've been given, and they have a ship that's meant to carry certain types of people or draw in certain types of people and carry them towards freedom in Christ, towards the fullness in Christ, right? Because we all see in part, and we all have a part of the bigger picture. Um, so I don't know. I just wanted to weigh in on that, and that's kind of been my journey of where I've had to resolve to stay at peace with everybody because, like, I'm not, you know – and the type of people that I'm generally drawn to, we're not, we actually want nothing to do with institutional ministry, right? We're very authentic relationship driven. So if it has kind of a more of a business model to it, we can feel, we generally feel it to be very inauthentic. Whereas somebody in a, maybe an older generation might feel a bridge ministry, one that has a flow of the spirit in more of an organizational ministry might enjoy that more but even you know i've been in those and i i don't love it for long periods of time because it's i find it stifling but that's again a different ship so i don't know if that kind of helps uh from a perspective i'm almost 40 so right so i I was just gonna say peter yeah like to your to your point um everyone's doing the best they can by the grace of god right but we don't make the uh the uh theology or doctrine out of that we what we do is we we hear the sound of the lord and we move towards him we hear the voice of the bridegroom and we move toward the bridegroom god will deal with um anyone how he will and we should always pray for the mercy and the grace of god for all situations so the but the thing is we have to as individuals make a choice of who are we partnering with And we can't sort of have that compromise of, well, they're doing their best they can, so we'll just partner with that. That's where I think we have to have this discernment of like, God bless them, um, but what the Lord is doing is over here, so I'm going to move over here. I agree Um, with that. You know, that's, I think that's, that's kind of the key thing to understanding. And that's, it's difficult because like, how do we do holiness without grace? Well, we have to have both. And the Lord is the one who, who shows us the way in that. Um, holiness is not religious spirit. It's like a desire for the righteousness of Christ in all things. Uh, Antoine, uh, Angela, you were going to say. Yeah. Um, so I suppose um, it's, it's really um, difficult to be able to 
um, understand what coming out of Babylon really means because everybody, um, and that's when you're saying you've got to really rely and trust that the Lord is leading us out of Babylon for those who want to, because it's a choice, isn't it? It's always a choice. So the bottom line is, if the Lord is saying, like in the days of Noah, I'm going to bring a judgment. This is the, the plan. This is my plan. Uh, in Noah's case, you've got to build a, a big ark in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the desert or whatever. And that's the plan. You either choose to do it or you don't. Uh, that's the plan. <laughs> it's not going right. to change, you know. And so likewise, I'm coming to judge Babylon. I have made a, a plan. There is no other plan. It is It is the plan. You can either choose to come out and, and depending on your choice is whether you will hear the next step on how to come out. Yeah. I don't think I don't think it's a theology that one can sort of say out there, this is the theology of coming out of Babylon. No, it's an obedience and a choice and a difficult one because the whole system is operating in the opposite spirit. Right. And I think that's where we have to keep pressing back into the Lord. Jesus said from 2000 years ago, did he not? Like you are in the world, but you're not to be of the world or partnered with it. So it's about pressing in. What does that mean, Lord? An analogy that I brought up in one of our other discussions was, you know how the um, Israelites had an interaction with merchants who were Gentiles and outside of Israel. Do you remember that? But they were prevented from coming in to the city gates of Jerusalem on Sabbath, right? Were the were the Israelites permitted to buy goods from those merchants? Yes. But they were not permitted to enter into business with those merchants to then adopt their practices, which were just the practices of the world. So you see the difference there? Coming out of Babylon does not mean we just uh, we we don't have interaction with the merchants anymore. We we are live isolated. We we don't ever um, uh, work with people in this fashion. It's a matter of the heart and partnering and staying pure before God. And basically, where there's a slavery or a soul tie or a tie back, we want to set have those things severed. So any kind of uh, thing that would that would rule over us is a hint that it's a partnership or a slavery that we got to come out of. Um, you know, but if we're buying a toothbrush at the store made by Colgate Palmolive, that's not really a problem, I don't think. I mean, I, others might have a different opinion. Um, right? So there's a difference between investing in Colgate Palmolive stock if they're doing things that the Lord hates and buying their toothbrush. That's like when you buy from the merchants outside of the gates of Israel, um, it was permitted according to the way of God, certain days in certain ways. But it was not permitted like, hey, let's go into business with those guys and we, then we'll sit by the side of the road and lay in wait and try to slay the people coming towards us. That's a Babylonian practice, right? A business practice. So I think that's part of this understanding is we can't say it's this or it's that or it's not this or it's not that. The, the, by the Spirit, we'll know those things. But what we can say is what the scripture says. What does um, what does Belial have to do with God? Nothing. No partnership. So that's that. I think is the is the thing that really God is saying that has gotten muddled over the centuries, really muddled up. And so now he's saying, separate yourselves from that partnership that's the spirit of that not separate yourselves from relationships with people who are in those things or separate yourselves from the geography of this world or separate yourselves unto a utopian new temple somewhere else um it's a matter of the heart and you know what tugs on our heart what causes us to be in, in galatians 5 to be the ways of the flesh versus the ways of the spirit meaning the fruits uh, what causes those things? Let's sever those 
ties, those snags, those soul ties, those slaveries, those forcible, you know, if I don't do this, then I'm in trouble with that, that kind of thing. And I'm not talking about now the, the, the governors who are set in place by the Lord to keep law and order. I'm talking about the choices we all have a free will to make about our financial relationships, our business relationships, our banking relationships, our investment decisions. These are free will choices that we have to make every day. So from an economic standpoint, that's how I'd address that. Does that make sense, Angela? Anybody else want to um, share back to Grant's fivefold teaching? Grant, any uh, parting wisdom as we close here? Just want to say a blessing on all of us on this call and those that will listen for love, patience, gentleness, and a vigilance to contend for these reforms to come into the body. Hallelujah. That we would see them by faith, and not by sight. Amen. So um, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks for everybody for joining the discussion. And thanks, Grant, for sharing in the teaching. God bless and keep you guys. And until next time, um, may the kingdom come and God's will be done here on the earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Love you all.